Hello everyone, greetings from National Skills Network. This is Madhuri and today I'm in conversation with uh, Dr. Madhu Sri Shekhar, who's the uh, Dean at TISS SVE. Let me tell you a little more about uh, Dr. Madhu Sri Shekhar, an academician of international repute and having done a lot of research in public policy and related areas, she holds two positions at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Currently, she is the Dean of International Relations Office and Dean School of Vocational Education at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. So welcome to this conversation, ma'am. Uh, we would really love to hear the entire story of the changes that are happening in the higher education segment of vocational education, especially uh, from the backdrop of the fact that uh, TIS has done phenomenal work, especially through BWO, in the early days of BWOC, uh, you know, with innovative models and also let me get uh, started by asking you about the current changes that are happening in this in terms of the model that uh, you were using earlier, which was popularly known as the hub and spoke model. So are we still following this model or are there any changes happening currently? Please tell us more about it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madhuri. And uh, it's my pleasure to be part of your conversation, to be part of this conversation with you. And I'm really honored. As, as you have said, yes, I'm an acad I'm, I function as a faculty in this, at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And my space of work is broadly in the area of institutions and governance, looking at the whole area public policy, particularly public policy at the implementation level, how it gets implemented. That's where I work and I function as. I also have, as you have said, uh, 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 an administrative role, which is, which is as the chairperson of the Office for International Affairs, which I'm holding at that Institute, where my main role is in uh, with, with working with our institute and working with other faculty and with other stakeholders, trying to promote internationalization at the higher education level, which is a major thrust on the, the new education policy. So I'm functioning. I also have been requested by our Vice Chancellor, Professor Shalini Bharat, to take over as and function as the Dean for the School of Vocational Education, which I took over in January, on 1st Jan 2021. So that's where I come in as a vocational space. And I look at, though I have not directly worked in the space of vocational education, but I look at it as an initiative that is very, that's a very, very important public policy initiative of the government of India, which is to create a, a skilled youth, have a skilled youth, and, and that's where. So from my perspective, I look at this whole program that which I'm now asked to chair as a you know, function as a dean, as a very important program, which looks at the whole, how do we deal with the young growing working population? So just to give you an idea of why I took this and find this a very interesting initiative of the, uh, of, of the government and of Tata Institute is because as you are all informed, we have almost 66% of our population is a young population, yeah. which is in the working age group population. And, uh, and, and this young population nearly accounts for 28% of the workforce of the global workforce. Hmm. Now, if this 28% of the global, of this population, which 66% of our youth account for 28% of the global workforce. Now, how do you make them effective? How do you make them citizens which can be a real resource for this country, a good resource? And that's where our skill and education vocation program comes in very, very important. You know? So, and today we are at that stage that where enrolling into vocational education training programs and graduating from our programs, we see massive improvements hmm. in the youth who have undertaken this program and how they value themselves in the, in the workforce. So this is where I feel that I would like to bring emphasize this point, you know, that they are a very valued part of our student population who actually not just we are also a university which has our master's program yeah. but it doesn't necessarily mean that they come out fully to be employed 
Hmm. They get into placement, they are programmed. But here are young graduates. The employability quotient of these young graduates is very high because they come out skilled enough to take on a job. We have got young students who have just 12 standard pass. Yeah. First rather, who joined our program, one of our master, I'll give you the details as I move forward in my conversation with you, who joined our bachelor program and after completing only one semester with us, has joined IIT Mumbai as an intern. Mm -hmm. So imagine, and this boy comes from a very rural part of Maharashtra. Okay. So coming from that background, aspiring to become an employed person, getting into an institution where they get an internship position at IIT Mumbai, they get it. It's a, it's a big step forward. You know? So that's where we really feel that we're doing something. This is about the program. And then you ask me the second question is, how do you look at your program shift? Yeah, the model, uh, current model that you're following for BWOC. Yeah. Yes, this is where I want to emphasize this. Once we took over, I took it as the lead in January. When we have our whole colleagues, you know, we have our main thrust was how number, uh, uh, we had to correct ourselves because, yes, we did have a very important vocational skill program started, which started initially around 2011 12. We started with 2015 when we started our graduate graduation program. But what we saw was we had a hub and spoke model. Hmm. As a university, deemed to be university, we are not allowed to have centers or hoardings put up anywhere in the country telling there are center of this. Okay. Unfortunately, the hub and spoke model gave scope for these hoardings to be put up all over the country. Wherein our different hub partners, different hub partners who are our partners for the skill program, put up their quotings telling that the skills, their Tata Institute Center for Skill Training, Vocational Education. Now, this is something which is not allowed. Mm -hmm. We had to make that legally, we are not allowed to do that. And unfortunately, because this was a new model in our entry, we never realized this you know, because there was no structure. We had to start vocational education program. We didn't have a formal structure. You know, the structure was, we experimented. You know, so that experimentation went wrong. Hmm. That's what, so our initiative in January, 2021, the first is to undo this mistake, to correct, make a path correction in this process. So what did we do? We had to remove the entire hub model, undo the entire hub. But undoing the hub model did not, should not be at the cost of the students who are already there and doing the programs. Yeah. So we had to undo the hub model, but secure the interest of the students who are already there because it's not their mistake. Mm. So secure the interest and also secure the reputation of the institute because as it is institute, we also had to ensure that this is not under anywhere in a position where it can be put under question. So because we are in Zoom. So we had to do. So we shifted the model. We shifted the entire. Now, while continuing the old students under the hub model directly with us, shifted the model. We have shifted to a model today where we do the entire academic program ourselves. Okay. Entire academic program ourselves, starting from admission, mobilization of students, admis admission of students into our portal, and uh, keeping the students with us, mm -hmm. controlling the, developing the programs ourselves and linking them up to the industry partner for the skill component training. Okay. So we do everything ourselves now. The hubs, we removed, we undid the hubs. What now we have with us are our skill service providers. Mm -hmm. Service providers are nothing other than Anybody, and we, we give them a code, the students, if they are in any way linked to us, <coughs> excuse me, they, they, bring, they provide the means because students from remote areas, different parts of the country, if they want to do this paper, these service providers help us 
in identifying those students and linking them up to us as universities and bring and guiding them to our websites and information where they get the service providers get a get paid per student the fees that we collect the fees is entirely collected by us we control the academic program we deliver the entire we have the teachers on board now under the whole hub model the teachers work with the hubs no now we don't have that teachers are our we pay them the teachers we do everything ourselves so this is and this is what and being local local locally connected service providers help us mm -hmm. in identifying the required if there is a particular region where they have a particular skill component which they feel students from that area want that skill education these service providers guide them to us and they also identify for us the skill partner skill knowledge partner skps where these students from that location can be guided to this school to get the training done hmm. skill because our program so this is where undone everything but without disturbing the students we have secured the students and we have taken ownership of the entire program ourselves okay yeah thank you so much for explaining the shift you have made uh, you know keeping in mind mostly the positive impact it is supposed to create on the students and i hope now this model is running smoothly at your centers uh, yeah yes uh, yeah it's so running very and we have got actually as you said we have been able to and our first component as i wanted just to make one point here is what you saw a significant large portion of our students you saw in hyderabad and not yeah. this hyderabad campus we had almost 400 students yes because for the generic subjects given we teach them ourselves so we guide our students depending on the location where they come the southern part of students southern india students were guided to our hyderabad campus yeah they came to do that on the immersion program while we from the north we guided about 500 students to come to our mumbai campus so mm -hmm. we had this huge students who came for the immersion contact class when we gave the generic subjects to classes okay yeah that's really interesting and uh, and and we saw it like a landmark thing happening when it comes to bwork because uh, just to give you a background about bwork and how we from nsn have been promoting it of course this was one of the stories we did uh, in 2016 or so but and during those days uh, people used to have very basic questions about bwork uh, like what is it how does it work uh, how, how do we work with ugc but today when we want to know more about we work i think there are lots and lots of colleges and universities offering so we see a lot of people uh, enrolling for this degree which is a very important uh, step i think in higher vocational education and since you are a policy expert now i would like to draw your attention to nep 2020 i think it's inevitable for us to uh, you know bring this into our conversation so uh, how do you see this policy uh, you know in terms of strengthening the higher vocational education special in terms of implementing industry integrated education you know and like flexible model like bwork where uh, if one drops out or discontinues after first year they get a, a diploma and an advanced diploma so we are experimenting with few things so uh, can we know your views on this yeah thank you so much that's that's really important question which you have asked you know i just wanted to make before i answer this question i wanted to say one point which you referred to you know today many colleges are offering the work to yes i agree with you that but what we are doing here at the tata institute of social sciences is little different here hmm. all our semester the six semesters every semesters our students do internship in the or we tell them placements in the industry partners okay we do not do it end semester activity which is done in many colleges or for you know so the difference so as and when the student moves forward they already are getting skilled with 360 hours of industry placed in skill knowledge training that is happening at the industry 360 hours every semester is built into the students academic program across it so this comes to your second question is how do we see the students coming up yes our students in keeping with the nep guidelines which is a very important that you create a skilled population now the skilled population how it is to be skilled 
and if he doesn't tell you straight, you know. But here is, the, it's a very important point that the new education policy has highlighted, that you need to create this skilled population. And mm -hmm. through our efforts and experiments at our level, we have realized that creating a skilled component at the end of the semester is not going to help. Yeah. Because that is where many of the colleges take the classes one, one, one teach the classes one, then they have, and then they do the skill component towards the end of the system, semester as an internship in an industry. Now, this is not sufficient skill. Mm -hmm. You need to have the classes and the skill component happening parallelly. Yeah. And that needs to be built into the academic program. And this is an implementation part of the NEP vocational program, which we have done it from our initiatives, looking because how we realize that this needs to be strengthened. Okay, so that is why today, while we are having students fully under the uh, working as provided under the uh, uh, under the NEP program, vocational students are getting skills. So NEP as a policy highlights the importance of skill education. It is at the functional level, as functional level, we work out the details of how to make the skill component, which is highlighted in emphasis, effective. Mm -hmm. Now to make it effective, we need to work out the systems through which this can be effective. Now, our system is to give skill training as an on-the-job training program across the semester, not as an end semester program. This is number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is NEP also talks about apprenticeships. Right apprenticeships okay in our other programs other general master's program other ba programs all of them what we have done is we have built in four credits that means 30 hours uh, sorry two credits two credits is 30 hours so four credits 60 hours so two credits programs two two credit programs that means 60 hours which is pulled into the under, under other programs under where students can opt for that. And this we have started as a special effort under our, for our undergraduate program, BA, BSc programs, which we have under, we have a built into that. So apprenticeship students are also under the undergraduate program in our non bivoc programs, okay. are also getting the apprenticeship programs. That means the skill training component. And we have mapped it as per our location because we have got undergraduate programs in our campuses in Hyderabad, rural campus in uh, in Kuljapur, our northeast campus in Guwahati, yeah. and our Mumbai. So, depending upon the location specific requirement of jobs or skill requirements, we have built this skill component into the into the undergraduate program. Hmm. Uh, that's very interesting to know. And I think you're also addressing this need for uh, uh, 70, 70, 30 percent, right? The theory practice uh, right, right. divide, which is ideal for vocational education. Yeah, um, so, yeah. And uh, you just mentioned about the locations and the demand for the industry. So maybe it would be nice to know more about you from, uh, you know, from this perspective of what are the high demand sectors, uh, let's say from the industry perspective. Uh, I can see that already your courses are, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressing the need for about 16 to 17 industry sectors, if I'm right, uh, from the website. Sectors, uh, 16 sectors. Yeah, 16 sectors where you have aligned it with NSQF, Apparently, uh, so uh, according to you, what are some of the high demand sectors uh, and the reasoning behind these locations you just mentioned? See, yeah, we have now we have our students now directly our students across 115 sites in the country. Hmm. 115 sites in the country where they have been mapped according to the according to the courses that they are doing. And as you rightly said, we follow the 70, 30%. 70% is skill training and 30% is taught classes. Yeah. Out of these taught, taught classes that we do, we also, we have, uh, we have our, uh, in terms of our, uh, uh, our the, uh, the component parts of how many hours of the skill training that they do is that they are, uh, uh, they spend almost uh, 360 hours to spend on the uh, industry, industry partner with the, uh, for the skill training. 180 hours they do with the generic general theory classes each mm -hmm. semester, 180 hours each semester, and 90 hours is domain specific theory classes, that okay. is the subjects income. 
Mm-hmm. Now, this 115 sec- sites we have across the country where we are doing, and uh, and uh, and and uh, and as you uh, um, uh, you wanted to know that uh, your question was uh, your, the the way you are addressing the, yeah, 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 the way are, pertaining to those areas. Right. So the our in those areas, so we do this domain specific, and our main so our programs that is from our program that we have done. What we have realized, our main uh, high demand courses, we have about 34 courses across 16 sectors, you know, industry sector. And these 34 courses of the, our most high demand courses are the life sciences programs. The life sciences, the, the sectors that come under the life sciences program. And these are, uh, these are our VWAP programs that, uh, 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 which are under our life sciences, which fall under Health, uh, child care protection, all of these may all of these come under these uh, wave of programs which are there under life sciences. And then we also have high hospitality courses, our courses that come under tourism, hospitality, cultural history, uh, cultural tourism, sustainable, all these programs. Are, and we are now working towards hospitality, hospitality sector as also a very important sector where we are working. Our, our health sector is one of the most demand high demand courses hmm. and you know but here is something that i would just like to tell you because it's high demand but unfortunately what is happening is health we have to give under skilled program we are asked to give the uh, the course the graduate program called as bvo now hmm. the paramedical sector paramedical center of the uh, uh, councils of the states you know for example we are now trying to work with the maharashtra paramedical council to recognize these two register because health they do not have in their list of degrees that they have to give BVOP mentioned. Right. Yeah. But the government of India is telling us to give BVOP degrees. We are doing as per the NEP guidelines, we are providing the courses, we are meeting the regular yeah, the hours of training that is specified, the skill component that is specified, but we have given that as title as BVOP. Mm-hmm. Now we are trying to get our health courses being recognized within the paramedical process. That is a challenge that we are facing today, but we are working on that. Hopefully, hopefully this problem will be there because the param- also they either we, are, we allow, they allow us to give this title. Like for example, we did a VWOP in optometry, hmm. but the optometric sector council told us that if you give a VWOP in optometry, nobody will take, nobody will give them jobs. You have to call B optom, B optoms. Okay. The optums. That is the core. That is the now. What we have to do for us, we have to correct that title and inform, get approval from the university grants commission. Hmm. We have to inform the though we are a grade one university, we can do that, but we have to keep the university grants commission in in the loop. We have to inform them. You know, we can't just do what we want to do. Yeah. So this is where this as a policy. I go back to the policy, but implementation part is not. If there is a convergence of the you know, of the policy part into the different offices that deal with this event, these challenges will not be there in the when you are executing. But we are making our efforts. Hopefully these problems can be sorted out. So our high demand sectors, as I said, was life sciences, hospitality, which we have not. But health, health is the highest demand where we have got maximum students for our health sector. Mm-hmm. But this is a challenge in the health sector here. Another one, another of our high demand sectors is the capital goods sector. Okay. The capital goods sector, which which where we do a number of our programs like the Bachelor of Vocational Education in Industrial Tools, we have manufacturing, we have the vocational program in in uh, in uh, in production technology. These are programs which are high demand. Hmm. We also have certain programs that are premier programs. Okay. Premier programs that is like Maruti. We have got our uh, retail. Uh, retail program linked with the uh, industry and also renewable energy, which is a premier program. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I think at this point, I would like you to uh, explain us a bit more about uh, how exactly the course is offered because uh, you mentioned that there is an induction like you gave us the example of Hyderabad, uh, you know, so after these students undergo the initial induction or the orientation, then how do they get divided and how do they get assigned to the theory and practical components where they have to, uh, you know, go to the industry environment and so on? It's not 
immersion class that mm. we do is for the generic stuff, general subject, because social science as it is social science or social science, generic classes are taken care by us. Mm -hmm. The subject, general subject, which are linked to social sciences, we take care of that. So we have got our own faculty and our own teachers who do that. So that we do it through a blended mode on the either through, or through now we were doing through the online. Otherwise, we go to the location, have find a neutral place which we hire and we take the, bring the students. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the larger picture. Yeah. Now, how do we do this? We, we map, as I told you, we map our students according to the region from which they come. Hmm. Now, a significant portion for our, for example, a student who are doing health program, there's a large chunk of the students who are from Kerala because there's a lot of health, health schools and health colleges which are working with us. They're working with us. Hmm. There's a significant population. There's a small group which is now emerging, which is premier group, which is working in energy and renewable energy with us. Hmm. So what do we do? Where these, these students are mapped, are picked up they, they, on our website, they yes. are linked to the, given the code of the service provider who helps them to come to us. Okay. So we, from that code, we can identify the student from where the student is coming to us, which part of the country. Now, depending on which part of the country they're coming to us, we also know that from that part, we have already mapped our industries. Okay. These industries are already linked to that code. Hmm. Industry, they are already linked to that code. In that region, these industries are there well. So students, when they apply for the program, they know which part they want to come from, where they want to, and where they do the industry. So the industry link is already connected through our admission portal. How do we do the general teaching of the subjects? We have got all our teachers on us. We have almost 130, almost 150 um, plus teachers who are our ad hoc teachers whom we have already listed and, and prepared them. You can see it on our website. We have them on our website. And we have them. Plus we have our own faculty within the School of Vocational Education who help us. Who Because we are a self-sustaining school. So we have to keep the program in a way where we can sustain and engage our faculty. Now these faculty are, the adult faculty are mapped as per the requirement of the course. Mm -hmm. course. Now these faculty are also identified on the basis of the location where this program is being carried out in India. For mm -hmm. example, 115 sites. I think if you look up 115 sites, you will get, you will, you will get an idea of, you see this, you know, you have this. You yeah. have 115 sites, you know, that is on our website, you get them. You know? yeah. So these 150 sites, you get details of what industry is there. So we accordingly put up faculty teachers in. Currently, we have two of our faculty who are now in, one is in Kerala and one is going to go up. But mm -hmm. teach the hospitality program, one of our faculty is going to teach. So our faculty either go to the site so that during those days, because Industry is also having its own interest. Yeah. Industry will not let the students who are there stipend, whom they are giving the stipend, because all our programs are stipend linked. Hmm. So industry is having the incentive to engage these students by giving them a stipend, so they get skilled people to work in the industry without yeah. paying for the full year. So they get a stipend. So they don't want to let up the students who attend the classes. So what we do, we map the courses, the generic courses into the weekends. Mm -hmm. So our, the domain specific classes, that is the domain specific classes are largely taught by the domain experts whom our industries help us to identify yeah. as per the locations. Mm -hmm. Our operation team helps us to identify that and as per locations we have them. The generic subjects, which are the general subjects, you know, each semester has its own gen, uh, has, has a common set of subjects, which is about 160, which we say starting from all the courses that are uh, in terms of, um, uh, we have, if you have seen our semester courses, you know, you know, the semester one will have functional English, communication skills, basic, basic, uh, basic introduction to Indian, Indian agriculture. Uh, so communication agriculture becomes the domain specific classes yeah so the uh, up to communication so we have 
basics, economics and market, environmental science, ethics and governance. These are our generic subjects. Each semester has it. So the generic subjects are taught by us. The domain specific subjects are taught by teachers and with us who are our adult faculty. We have got almost 100 plus adult faculty. Yeah. We map them. And the domain classes are taught at the site because they do the industry on the skill training at the industry plus the skill training is done. Hmm. This is how we, it's a very complex system. <laughs> Uh, so uh, now you just mentioned about adjunct faculty and also, you know, uh, faculty members or experts who come from the industry. Uh, and that is the essence of any vocational program. So my next point would be to learn more about how do you uh, manage capacity building in terms of uh, ensuring that the faculty members are uh, appropriately trained and they are updated with the dynamism of the industry and so on. That's a very important question that you've asked. You know, what your, yes, capacity building of faculty is very, we have training the trainer programs with us. Mm -hmm. We have our programs, which, which are which we We have our domain experts. We have a list of experts from the industry and from the field, all of them come mm -hmm. to us. Meanwhile, now we are going to have, after I took over as Dean, you know, as a dean, we are going to have our first domain expert meeting on 4th and 5th of of, of July, of, of July, where we are having the domain experts coming to us. One is capacity building of faculty to take the classes. Second is capacity building of faculty to understand the course content and the shift in the course content and update the courses and make them viable. Hmm. So two types of capacity building we need to do. It's not just teaching them how to take a class. It's, it's, they are all, they all know that. Hmm. They come with that expertise and they know that. Our capacity building is yes. Now also we do we do these two streams. You know the capacity building is around these two there. So we are also doing training the trainers, which is normally done, which we orient the teachers because these are young students, young children who very often do not know the languages that we are going to talk to them. Mm -hmm. So we need to have people to be able to communicate to them at that language. Mm -hmm. We need to create a the generic subject, we need to create a, a teaching capacity among teachers. As teachers, we have the arrogance, you know, we all have an arrogance as teachers that we know best. Hmm. You know, that is the arrogance of teachers. And we talk to them in a way, language that they may not understand. Hmm. So the first training for the teachers is understanding is communicate to the teachers, to the students in a way that they're able to find it interesting and Answer. So that's what we do the training on teacher because we don't need to teach train them on the subject. Hmm. Subject is not important because we are already identifying skilled people and informed people who are teaching the subject. Hmm. We create the capacity in them to be able to communicate with these young children. Hmm. That is second level of capacity is creating the capacity and knowledge system to ensure that our courses are up. Hmm. For which we have domain, like said, we have we have prepared our where we have prepared this best skilled domain expert list with us. Yeah. I'm, I'm very happy about that. We could do that because we have identified some of the best people and who are our domain, who have access to the other domain. So we ask them, they will be reviewing our course content and advising us how best we can improve the course content and keep it updated so that the students find it useful for them when they graduate from this program. So this is how we do the domain expert. So we have, and also we have got a whole expert uh, um, expert list, you know, domain experts plus uh, experts who help. So this is how we do that. In fact, today we are also looking at creating skilled teachers to be able to teach the specially able children. Mm -hmm. You know, specially able children are 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 a group of children who also who fall out of the of this of the basket, you know, because yeah. when you're doing skill training, you don't think about these children. Yeah. The young, they are also young. They also need to be created a skill. So we are now thinking about and exploring. And that's where I want to bring in is that where our international collaborations as the chair for the international, I'm trying our best to ensure that we develop our skilled teachers, a, mm. a skilled cohort of teachers or trainers who can be able to communicate with children who need special support. 
yeah that's very interesting ma'am and uh, besides all the uh, facts that you shared the details that you shared is there anything else you would like to share with our audience maybe your advice to youth you know who are interested i, would, I also want to say one more thing you know because yeah. i want to say is that we are talking so much about a skill program but you know as a program i want to say that as in this you know i i want to say that we have completed 6519 graduates from our program okay congrats <laughs> our program which our actually our teaching program started we started in toyota but our mask other graduate program started in 2015 16 you know that's it. so we had our first graduate graduating by about 7 18 you know so 28 so we have till now have 6919 graduates this i'm giving to the youth of the country to tell them that how important skill program as a message is you know we have out of this 6519 graduates almost 4400 have been successfully placed mm -hmm. so that means placement levels of our programs is almost 70% mm -hmm. so these students get absorbed into the industry where they are doing the you know, stipend largely mm -hmm. getting there. but interestingly what is more important to emphasize here is that almost 5500 students so far us of our students have actually have actually not did not take up the placements either went in for higher education or started their own entrepreneurship mm -hmm. that is an important part you know so we have information about 84 85 students of us who have started own self entrepreneurship they have become entrepreneurs themselves and giving jobs to others and the young graduates yeah <laughs> young graduates you know and and 500 and 500 plus students have gone for higher education yeah. you know this this shows that skill which was looked as a not wanted programs parents wanted only students to go for doctors engineers and others today can come into these programs yeah. they are good students can come in they can they get graduation if they get graduate and they do well do well with the industry partners there's high scope for getting employed and yes. today they are a future you know they are a future and if we have a skilled youth who can who doesn't have to depend for a government job on this yeah you know and, so yeah and that's the need of the country also today to uh, help them you know become entrepreneurs and job creators and uh, it's very exciting to hear about the impact the program has created at the grassroots level like you mentioned students diversifying into higher education from vocational segment as well as launching their own enterprises this is a live example um, i hope our audience are able to appreciate all these things happening in the uh, vocational higher education segment in india many things happening for the first time and most of them being pioneered by uh, tiss that is tata institute of social sciences school of vocational education so ma'am uh, um, what would be your message to youth who are interested in uh, you know probably trying out a vocational higher education course i think it's a very interesting and a very challenging part we when we when we were young we started ba bsc we knew what to do you know the <laughs> students are you know with uh, with agnipat you know with agnipat i was seeing the yeah, students did not know what to do you know you know it's a program you know it's a very important skill program it's a very important pro policy of the government but people did not understand what it is you know? so as you have patience understand what is being offered to you look up the program i did don't get carried away and misled by information that is not true try to see the value of all the because all efforts are being aimed to help our young population mm -hmm. to make them employable to make them skilled to create a skill population to ensure that they understand the country of which they are very important citizens of this country mm -hmm. so my 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 sincere hope and and wishes is that our you please try to understand what is our efforts are being done yes education higher education is changing and one more thing i want to tell very much is the landscape of higher education is changing in this country yes it is changing the landscape is changing the nep has brought in immense opportunities the nep has opened up multiple doors for universities across the country and 
we must all as teachers we are all trying to make sure that we avail these opportunities as students as young population please take advantage of the opportunities that are coming across to you and wish you all the best that's yeah. the best thing i can say i don't know what else to say thank you uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing the story of uh, tiss bwork courses and also your initiatives in the vocational higher education ma'am thank you so much uh, we look forward to be in touch with you in future as well and continue to share the updates on our uh, channel as well as on our website thank you thank you dr madhuri it was a pleasure talking to you